This is part three of a video which describes the broad strokes of a methodology for the design of a jammer for ship defense against drone attack. But even though I used the word design in the first two videos, I, I don't like that word. Uh, and I'm not going to reshoot the videos, but this video is really more about a methodology for evaluating choices of three parameters for a jammer, for a drone jammer. The jammer transmitter power, the jammer transmit antenna gain, and the height of the jammer transmit antenna above the mean sea surface. So it's not really a design, it's more of an, eva an evaluation methodology. Now, um, in part one of the, and by the way, for reference, the drone in this case, for illustration purposes, is a surface drone which is um, uh, uh, guided by an operator uh, where the operator receives a video feed from the, the drone. And so there's two channels, communication channels between the operator and the drone. One is the feedback, the video from the drone, and the other one is the feed forward, which is the control signal sent by the operator to the drone. In part one, the video part one, uh, introduced the concepts for evaluating uh, those three parameters. Part two talked about and described the practical steps to set up whatever software you're using for this, it's a conceptually how to set it up, and to generate, evaluate, score, and rank um, so-called dry runs, where dry runs are simulation runs where the ECM is turned off. And they're important because that's how we determine the improvement caused by having ECM. Uh, you know, and, and, and because we can compare the uh, probability of a drone miss with and without ECM, then we can score and rank uh, choices of those three parameters and because we can rank them we can pick the best one the one which provides the best protection so let's pick up at step five of nine steps which means which involves uh, uh, generating the wet runs and these are the runs where the simulation uh, ECM is active in the simulation okay now we generate populations like the first one but this time the jamming is switched on and once again, in each run, all the parameters are randomized. And here's a key, key, key point. Copy all the random number seeds from the dry run population and use them in the corresponding runs in the wet run populations. This way, the corresponding runs in the two populations, dry and wet, are identical except for jamming. Now, the reason for doing this is so that forensic troubleshooting can be done if something looks fishy in any of the populations. It's the only way I know of of finding out if there's a, there is or there isn't a problem. And forensic analysis means stepping through the code line by line until you understand and can perfectly explain every aspect of its behavior. Now, the only way to be sure that this methodology described in this, in this video uh, produces a, a correct final answer is to apply a zero tolerance policy on unexplained anomalous behavior. Anomalous behavior in software is going to happen, it's part of the territory, comes with the territory, but anomalous unexplained behavior, that's not allowed. This is what they did in Apollo. Yes, there were anomalies, but unexplained anomalies, not okay. Now this is a painful, boring, time-consuming and expensive process but it produces the most correct answer possible 100% uh, of the time. So here's how the wet runs work. The jammer power delivered to the drone's receiver increases as the drone gets closer to the ship because it's getting closer to the jammer. And at the same time, the control signal power is decreasing as the drone gets farther from its transmitter. The drone is guided by the operator as long as the control signal power in the drone is sufficiently higher than the jammer power in the drone. And for illustration purposes, let's say the drone is guided as long as the jammer power is below the control signal power. That's equivalent to saying the jamming to signal ratio is 0 dB, just for illustration. Then in the present case, the operator is modeled as a proportional navigation guidance law. So when it's connected, the operator acts like a, a guided missile, really. But as soon as the jammer power becomes higher than the control signal power, then the operator becomes disconnected from the drone. Again, for illustration purposes, this condition is modeled uh, by the drone following a random heading process determined by surface waves, just as we've seen in, uh, or seem to see in videos. 
And if the prop propagation is realistically modeled, then it is reasonable to assume that the guidance signal may be disconnected and reconnected several times as the drone passes through a transition region between long range, where the control signal dominates, and near range, where the jammer signal dominates. When the guidance signal becomes disconnected, the drone may switch to one or more alternate strategies, guidance strategies, and here are some options. For example, it might continue its path using inertial navigation, possibly traveling in a straight line, or it might maintain the last demanded turn rate. Or it might use AI target image recognition to pick out the target, although it will have to contend with complications like water splashed on the lens or intermittent obscuration by smoke or waves. All the same, this is a majorly serious threat. Here's a link to a video posted by a young guy four years ago that shows in 15 minutes exactly how to use OpenAI software to make a commercial off-the-shelf drone recognize his face and follow him around a room, including the AI training step, which is all graphical. Or it could use celestial navigation, although that won't take it to the target. It could allow the drone to re-establish a correct heading if it has been using celestial navigation uh, you know, as an assist all along. So there's a time history of, of uh, celestial measurements. However, for simplicity, in the present case, to illustrate this methodology, and since this video is just to illustrate those principles, we'll assume that the drone path is determined by uh, a random heading process, as described in previous uh, video. In each run, the propagation effects are calculated for the forward link between the jammer and the drone, and for the aft link between the drone and the operator. Now, to figure out the effect of jamming, we need to know the jamming power in the drone's receiver compared with the control signal power. So as the drone approaches the ship, the changing geometry causes the jamming in the signal in the forward link and the guidance signals in the aft link to scintillate differently. And this means that the guidance signal might be connected and disconnected several times in a single run, just depending on how the peaks and nulls of the jamming and the guidance signals line up in the drone receiver as the drone approaches the ship. And since all the simulation parameters are randomized uh, between runs, then the effect of jamming will be different in every run and the drone path will be different in every run. And that's why we need to compile statistics about uh, the effect of jamming. Step six, use a custom software application to calculate the, re the three results. Okay, result one is a sanity check. It's essential to check that all the runs in a population match the expected con software config configuration for that population. So there's no accidental contamination with runs from, different, from a different population. And believe me, it is an easy mistake to happen. I've done it. To do this check, though, every simulation run in every population must be accompanied by a, let's call it a fingerprint configuration file saved at runtime so we can see exactly what the parameter values were that were used in that run. So we can make sure all, uh, all, the, uh, all the runs fit within the uh, description that they're supposed to for the population name. So, I mean, if we have a population where the wind speed is supposed to be zero meters per second, there can't be any runs in there with the wind speed at 10 meters per second. Or if the population uses a curved earth model, then there can't be any runs in there that use a sea swell model. This can happen if just by a finger problem, by moving files or, or software error. And as I said, it's very easy to make these kinds of mistakes. And if there is a mistake, or even the suspicion of a mistake, maybe all the data have to be regenerated and reanalyzed. And that could be time consuming. The only way to be sure is to have an automatic process to check the population for internal consistency. Every population, each one. So for example, the file consistency check panel shows here that all the files that are currently selected in all the directories that are selected, they're all consistent. They match the configuration controls shown on the main data analysis form. And if there is a file that's out of bounds, it doesn't match up with the expected uh, configuration, then it might look like this. And it works retroactively too. If a little doubt creeps in after the analysis is finished, the populations can always be rechecked to confirm that nothing was overlooked. Uh, uh, this is a boring step and it's a pain in the ass, but it is essential. The most expensive job is the one you have to do twice or more than twice. It also is a way of filtering out invalid runs if, if those show up. You don't want to include those in the analysis either. 
Result two, we're still in step six, result two is the probability of a drone miss. Aha, now we're getting somewhere. If the population is confirmed to be pure, tabulate the hits and misses for each of the eight populations and calculate the probability of a miss. And then, by the way, this is where the population's probability of occurrence is applied. The probability is assigned in step two. In order to get the ensemble statistics, um, we have to properly weight all the populations, all eight populations, all the runs in all the populations. Result three is the ensemble mean miss distance and ensemble confidence interval. Okay, the ensemble confidence interval is the variation of drone range around the mean miss distance, which encompasses an area of the miss distance probability density function equal to the desired confidence of the answer. That's easier, that's simpler than it sounds. The miss distance probability density function is also called the PDF, which is written in lowercase letters. Now, how do I get the uh, miss distance PDF? It's easy. Divide the range from the ship to the drone attack start range into a, uh, range bins, let's say 10 meters wide, each one, and then count the number of, using all the populations, count the number of miss distance instances in each bin. And that's it. That'll make a kind of a bell, kind of a curve. So back to the confidence interval. If, for example, uh, let's say we want 95% confidence, then the variation of drone miss distance has to encompass 95% of the area of the miss distance PDF. The confidence interval is the range variation that makes that happen centered on the mean miss distance. And for a different confidence interval, let's say 50%, it looks like this. The mean miss distance and confidence interval needed need to be calculated for several different ship headings relative to the direction of the drone attack. And uh, the relative ship heading is important, as I said before, because the probability of miss depends on the projected width of the ship, and end aspect is harder to hit than broadside. Step seven. You have to repeat steps one to six for 5.8 gigahertz instead of 2.4 gigahertz. Well, you gotta do it for each frequency that, that the thing is using, or each combination of frequencies is likely to use. Step eight is a limited sensitivity analysis. Okay, we're going to wiggle the two things we can control or three things we can control, two things we can control, and see what happens to the probability of drone miss and confidence interval. The two things we can control are the transmit antenna height and the jammer effective radiated, radiated power. This is also called the ERP, which is a combination of transmitter power and transmit antenna gain. Now, the idea here is to see if a small change in either of these parameters can improve the miss distance statistics. Now, higher power will always be desirable, but it may be that a small change in antenna height can boost low power performance. I mean, what are the odds that a randomly picked jammer antenna height is the best possible position for the expected range of attack scenarios? You know, it seems small. So this means repeating steps two to seven. You can see this is time consuming, but you can get the answer. Two to seven for four cases. Case one, raise the nominal jammer antenna height by a bit, holding the jammer ERP at the already used, let's say nominal value with its nominal variability. Case two is case one, but lower the jammer antenna height by a bit. Case three, probably see where this is going, keep the original antenna height, nominal value and variability, and increase the jammer ERP by a bit. And case four is the same as K3, but lower the ERP a bit. Okay, step nine, and this is the last step. Make two tables of missed distance statistics that look like this. Then take your favorite colored pencil crayon and circle the table entry that most closely matches the agreed upon performance specification. And if it meets or exceeds the specification, you're done. Then it's time to validate the results with some experimental testing, usually uh, starting with like a lab bench and coaxial cables, and maybe then an anechoic chamber for tests. So we get some free space happening. Oh, that, that's a bit dodgy. And then at sea tests. Now, if it doesn't match the specifications, make a judgment based on the tables, uh, a judgment call uh, on, the, you know, on the sensitivity analysis as to whether the original specification is achievable. And if you think it is, 
It's necessary to go through the methodology again, but changing one or both controllable parameters to nudge the results to where it needs to be. The uh, sensitivity tables are your map for how to do that and how much to move by. And if it isn't possible, then that information needs to get fed back up the food chain so that either the requirement specification changes or the constraints change because we can't alter the laws of physics and electromagnetics. Now this approach evolves, involves a lot of software and a lot of simulation and a lot of bookkeeping and meticulous care during execution, but it will give you the right answer. And this concludes a broad strokes explanation of how I personally would specify and justify the design of a counter drone jammer where the specification comprises the jammer ERP and antenna height.